Brown Brothers. Well, mine too. Hi, Jerry. 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 Hi,
shower and she said she felt bad because yeah, I was taking office. care of her. I was supposed to be her job and take care of her. I thought, I've had a broken leg too. You sit down and let me take care of her. Hush. You mean it's broke? I remember I was. I forget where I was. Yeah, I'm sorry. She broke it when we were coming back. It's like all those trees. And everything is more than you've got to lock down things down there. Uh -huh. I was, came out of this house. This, oh, that's me. This guy had asked me for some information about finances. And uh, I was walking down and he had a uh, store. And then he had four wooden steps. And I took my first step on the back side. And I got up and he said, You need to be more careful. I said, I can own you. Yeah, I said, You better watch your attitude. I just it's your responsibility to make sure that I don't fall. Yeah. Yeah. Like, he didn't buy we call them, we call them All of our sisters have fallen on that day. They didn't have something. They were wondering. Uh -oh. so at least she's not the opposite. No, she's not the opposite. I doubt if he's going to do anything about it. That's how they are down there. There it is. You live with it. Well, good morning to everybody. How are you today? Good to hear it. Peachy. Peachy? That's even better and good. Yeah, peachy. That's good. <laughs> Amen. Well, uh, good to have you with us today. And uh, the sun was shining so pretty early this morning, and then all of a sudden, look what happens, you know. Uh, now we have rain, but we need rain, so not the end of the world. I mentioned to you uh, a couple weeks ago about this guy. Um, he was in uh, uh, Pennsylvania, and he got arrested. Uh, he was standing outside just quoting Bible verses in a public area, um, and uh, he was quoting Bible verses during what was an ongoing pride parade. <laughs> And um, they came and uh, told him that he couldn't say those words, the police. And he said, well, I'm in a public area. I have the right to say whatever I want to say. I'm not being ugly. I'm just reading what the Bible says. Yeah, Bible. Uh, they uh, they beat him, not beat him physically, but they beat him up mentally about that. And he didn't stop, and so they arrested him. And uh, they charged him um, <clears throat> with uh, several uh, charges. Um, and uh, so there was pop <coughs> public outcry. And I just read the other day that they released him with no charges. But, you know, you have to go through, through all that and all the public uh, uh, shame that goes with it. So, but anyway, I'm saying at least, <clears throat> at least he was not... <clears throat> thrown behind bars or put into a uh, solitary confinement because he spoke what somebody didn't want him to speak. So, uh, nice to know that sometimes there's a happy ending to it, amen? But he got the publicity. Yeah, he did get the publicity. Yeah, yeah that's yeah. good. Yeah. If he'd done dirty words, they probably wouldn't have done it. Wouldn't have cared. No, no, or he could have stood there with all of his clothes off. Yeah. Uh, with the... Uh, uh, primary kids around him and uh, <laughs> exposed himself and they wouldn't have cared. But don't, don't quote that Bible. And, it's a uh, shame it takes a public outcry to stop them from doing something stupid to someone like that when they were doing what's right. Yep. And the guys behind them were doing what's wrong in mass and nobody says a word. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so from time to time I'll bring you those uh, comments just so <clears throat> I can get you thinking. So there's this blonde guy <clears throat> Anybody blonde in here that takes offense at blonde jokes? All right. Yeah. But some of us have turned <laughs> some of us have turned gray, and if it's not gray, it's turned loose. So, um, but uh, so <laughs> one of the two. But but here's a joke. A blonde-haired guy. He acquired two dogs. 
And of course, you happen to have names for dogs. So he named the dogs <clears throat> Rolex and Casio. A friend asked, why? I've never heard those names before. Why, why did you name your dogs Rolex and Casio? And the blonde gentleman replied, <laughs> they're watchdogs. Okay. Oh. 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 <laughs> okay. <laughs> Sorry, I, I couldn't resist. It was just too much for me not to, not to say that. All right. Uh, Revelation chapter 1. Are you cold, warm, or just right? Warm. Just right. Warm. Warm. Um, warm. I was a little warm, but I didn't know if that would just be. Give me five seconds. One. Three, two. Two. <laughs> How'd I do? <laughs> <laughs> that was a good one. <laughs> I'm telling you, I surprised myself I can count. Uh, all right. So Revelation chapter 1. Uh, I was so proud of myself last week. I think we got three verses, um, and I was just so excited. Uh, but uh, today we're not going to be as fortunate. I'm just kidding. Okay. <clears throat> Uh, we, we started our study in the uh, book of Revelation uh, a few weeks back. Uh, we'll be here for a long time. Um, but uh, <laughs> nothing new under the sun, huh? Uh, yes. But if, if uh, starting the study is how fast we can get through it, then you're in the wrong class, okay? But starting the study is so that we can learn. Uh, welcome aboard. Amen? Uh, but we've done the first... Um, uh, uh, several verses. We're on verse 6 right now, and uh, we concluded with that last week, and uh, here John is speaking, and uh, he is telling us about this revelation of Jesus Christ, how he's going to be revealed to the world, and we put this chart up here, from eternity to eternity is what we know of as time, as the Old Testament and New Testament, the upcoming tribulation and following that is the millennium, a thousand year reign of Christ. And we kind of put some dates here just so you can estimate where we are uh, in time. <clears throat> but John lives right about here. And uh, he is writing about the revelation of Jesus Christ. We know that the tribulation is to bring the Jew back into a desire to know Jesus. That's the whole purpose of it, is people have a, you know, like if you have kids, and you say, clean up your room, they don't clean up their room, clean up your room, they don't clean up, clean up your room, they don't clean up your room, you say, you are now on detention. And you stay in your house, and in your room, you can't go anywhere until that room gets cleaned up. How fast does that room get cleaned up? Pretty fast, okay? So the whole idea is God, uh, Jesus made his appeal to his own people, the Jews, for years, and they rejected him. And this is going to be the final detention. This is where he will bring them through persecution and oppression to the point where they will be like the kid that says, I got to stay in my room, you know, and that, that's kind of the awareness of it. And at the end of that, he's going to reveal himself. He's going to come back right here. <clears throat> That's I'm revealing myself back to the world. And the Bible writes it like this in Zechariah, every eye shall see him. So when he comes back, that's the revealing. And that's what this book is all about. It's telling us what's going to happen right here in this period of time to where Jesus is revealed. And uh, so it's not just his revelation here, but it is the work towards that revelation. And so when we're speaking of the book of Revelation, we're speaking primarily of these seven years. All right? And just so that you have a little idea of where the book of Revelation fits. And in verse 6, we notice this. Um, uh, he hath made us kings and priests unto God and his Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Let's start with a word of prayer. Father, thank you so much for this time. I pray, Father, that you bless us, open our heart and our eyes, 
and our ears and our minds to learn and bless, I pray, our desire to see and know you in a real and a personal way. Father, I pray that you'd be with Phyllis this morning who fell and broke her ankle, and I pray that uh, her recovery would be quick and, um, Lord, without complication. I'll be with others that are not able to be with us today for other reasons and minister our needs today uh, as we uh, sharpen one another in our walk with Christ. And we'll thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, so we mentioned yesterday that it's, or last week, excuse me, <clears throat> if you look at verse 6, it isn't he will make us kings and priests, but it says, and hath made us. So this has already happened, and we talked about that, is that um, the first thing that priests do is they make sacrifices, and the second thing that they do is they bring folks together, they reconcile people with God. And so when we look at the Old Testament example of priests, they make sacrifices. In Romans 12, 1, we learned last week that God, uh, Paul said to the Roman Christians, I beseech you therefore, my brethren, by the mercies of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you present your body a living sacrifice. So we, in, in the role of being a priest, one of the things that we do is we live our life so that people recognize the difference that we are, all right? And the sacrifices that we make, we find out later are not really sacrifices at all, all right? Like last night, I didn't go out and tie one on, and I didn't wake up with my cheek glued and my own vomit to the bed covers. Uh, what a sacrifice. Okay, you know, we find out later on that those sacrifices are really were not that big of a thing, but we present our bodies to Christ. It's a living sacrifice. We die daily to self uh, for Christ to live through us. That's one of the functions that we have right now. And then also, we reconcile humankind to God. And the Bible says there in First Corinthians, or excuse me, Second Corinthians chapter five, verse eighteen and nineteen, that we are ambassadors of, of God. Uh, we reconcile the world unto Jesus Christ. We call that one word today in Christianity is called evangelism. All right, we go out and we intentionally try to evangelize. You have not seen a church on fire until you've seen a church that the people going to it realize that they're to be intentional about sharing their faith. Most churches are not intentional about sharing their faith. They're intentional about being a very tight-knit club. I go to that church. All right. It's this ownership of a building and of a group of people. The Church of Jesus Christ wasn't interested in bricks and mortar. Look at it in the book of Acts. They were interested in getting the message out of the redemption that's in Jesus Christ. Americans' churches are just like Awana clubs, or uh, I can't even think of the, what is it, some of the clubs. I've never been involved in them, so I don't know what, whatever they are, you know, that, that you see, Kiwanas and Awanas and Bananas and Bananas, and I don't know what all they are, but all these clubs is that uh, they all have uh, boards and they all have places for you to serve. And uh, I've been a member of this club for 37 years and I've served on the board 35 times. I mean, those are the things that people say. But the Christian church that's found in the book of Acts would never make those kind of comments. They would say, we went over to Macedonia and we tried to tell them about Jesus Christ and they picked up stones and they threw them at us. And apart from God intervening, we would have been dead right then. Wouldn't that have been a wonderful thing? To die for Jesus Christ, telling other people about him. That's not what you hear in the Christian church today. <laughs> Testimonies. My toe really hurts. And I want, uh, are y'all are with me? You know I'm telling the truth. <laughs> I mean, I, we, the Christian church is about gone. I mean, it's about gone. It's just a glorified club. There's just nothing 
nothing hardly at all about the modern Christian church that resembles the Acts New Testament church. But if you get a church that is intentional and personally responsible, each person, about sharing their faith, and you have no idea what could happen in a church. You want an example? The early book of Acts. Did not we straightly command you not to preach or teach in this name? Whose name? Jesus. Jesus. And behold, you have turned the world upside down. That's what they said. Not of a church of 250, but of three men. <laughs> and you have turned the world upside down. I, we have no idea what could happen in a local church if people became intentional and personal about sharing their faith. All right. That, that was a commercial. Didn't cost anything. I wouldn't even a review. I don't think we talked about that last year. I don't know where that came from. Just, All right. All right. So that's the priest part. But he's also made us kings. And that is, according to Revelation chapter 5, verse 9 and 10, one day we're going to reign with him. When Jesus is revealed, he's coming right back here like this, right where that ticket mark is, coming down here. And when he comes down, he's going to have war with the world. Mm -hmm. And uh, I already read the end of the book. They, they lose. Okay? Uh, and then he's going to set up a thousand-year reign on this earth. When you have a king that reigns, what do you have to have in order for, for him to effectively reign? You have to have a tiered government. And so we'll reign with Christ. Now this is one time where even if I was the sanitation engineer, I wouldn't mind because I'm on the right king, uh, with the right kingdom and the right king. But uh, based upon how we live our life for Christ, the Bible's indication is, is that the uh, opportunities for reigning with him will ba be based upon our current faithfulness to him. And that makes sense. Logical sense is that if I want someone on my team, I want someone that's dependable, right? I want someone that I can count on, right? So this is the idea uh, of uh, reigning with him. So he hath made us, not will, but hath made us kings and priests unto God and his Father. Now, moving on, we come to verse 7. A little applause right there. Okay. Uh, verse 7. And it says, Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him, and they also which pierced him, and all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. Even so, amen. All right? So here we have this uh, uh, interesting thing. John speaks of Jesus' second coming and gives us some specifics on it. First of all, he comes with what? Clouds. Clouds. Okay. Turn, hold your hand there in Revelation. We're coming back. But turn to Acts chapter 1. Acts chapter 1. Acts chapter 1. chapter 1. <clears throat> Notice in Acts chapter 1, if you would, with me, verse number 9. And when he had spoken these things, the he, if you walk back, is Jesus, okay? When he had spoken these things, while they behold, they are the uh, disciples that were uh, with Jesus, while they beheld, he, Jesus, was taken up. And a what? cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven, as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, which said, which also said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, which is taken up from you in heaven, into heaven, shall so come in like manner as you've seen him go into heaven. So, How's he going to come back? Clouds. 
All right? That's one of the things. I mean, it's a, the Bible is its best interpreter. Uh, if you have to read a commentary, that's okay. But the best interpreter of the Bible is the Bible itself. It will tell you exactly what it, it means. So back to Revelation uh, chapter 1, verse 7. That says, uh, Behold, he cometh with clouds. Secondly, what do we see here in verse number 7? Every eye shall see him. All right, the context is the revelation or the second coming of Jesus Christ, and every eye will see him. Second coming. Now, the second coming, as we have studied before, um, the second coming uh, occurs in two stages. All right, maybe you weren't here to see that before, but we have the first stage. Here and the second stage here. We cover a span of seven plus years. Alright? Seven plus years. So two stages. Alright? Maybe you would call, maybe you don't. Um, the Bible teaches an early exit for the Christian before the tribulation. Uh, it's called the gathering, or often referred to as the rapture. Uh, that's the word that we've attached to it. The Bible's word is gathering. But we, we define it as the rapture. It's not a bad word. It's descriptive, but it's not the Bible word. The Bible word is gathering. And um, <clears throat> we see this in several places. Uh, keep your hand there and uh, maybe put a bookmarker or something there in uh, Revelation chapter 1. And go with me, if you would, to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and look at verse 51 through verse 54. Now, every time you hear the word 1 Corinthians 15, you should think of resurrection. Okay, the chapter 15 is the resurrection chapter, 1 Corinthians 15. And here in verse number 51, towards the end of the, the book, notice what it says. Behold, I show you a what? A mystery. A mystery. What's that mean? When we read a mystery novel or we watch a mystery TV show, what's that mean? You find out everything at the beginning? Or you find out everything at the end. Why don't people just go to the end? They like the mystery. They like to what? Try to figure it out. Right? Isn't that how we do it? We say, uh, Brennan and I, every once in a while, we'll read or we'll watch, and I'll say, who do you think did it? Who do you think did it? Who do you think did it? She said, would you just leave me alone and let me watch the show? And I said, who do you think did it? Who do you think did it? Uh, it's the mystery. That's the whole idea of it. The mystery is it's unknown. And people like to figure it out. I could have said that we're having a study in Genesis, and I don't know that there would be as many people that would have been as interested in that study as Revelation, because the Revelation is the mystery. And we want to know. Okay? Nothing wrong with that. It's the way God made us. But this, the whole idea of this is the mystery. Behold, I show you a mystery. So he's going to reveal it. Here's the mystery. When do you have the mystery? At the beginning? No, you have it at the end, right? Okay. So, I'm going to show you the mystery. Here it is. We shall not all, what? Sleep. Verse 51, we shall not all sleep. In the Bible, what does sleep represent? Often. Death. Okay. So, we shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. You know what that means? What you have right now won't work. <laughs> okay. We all have to be changed. We may not all die, but all of us, whether we die or not, are going to have to be changed, okay? And when's it going to happen? Well, in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye. That's pretty fast. I don't even know my eyes blink. Do you know when your eyes blink? Well, sometimes when I go, or late at night when I'm going. And she said, You're, are you asleep? I said, no. <laughs> She said, your eyes are closed. I go like this. And then I realized I blinked. Okay, you know, so 50, 
15 seconds after they close. But normally you don't you don't get it. They, they go they go so fast. So in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump. Now that's the first thing that we are given that is not in a moment, in a twinkling, but now we have a definite period of time, the last trump. And then he explains it, for the trumpet shall sound. So God has a trumpet, and he's going to play this trumpet, and this trumpet will usher in the great gathering we call the rapture. A trumpet shall sound, and the dead, here's the change, shall be raised, not corruptible, but incorruptible, all right? And we shall be what? Because I'm not physically dead, but what do you know about this body? It's corruptible. You know what? Every day I look in the mirror, I think, I didn't notice all those changes when I was 16, 17, 18. All right? The only change I recognize is I started getting this fuzzy stuff on my cheek. But, but, but now as you get towards the other end of the spectrum, Every day you realize, you know, someone was telling me the other day, he says, I just can't do what I used to do. You know, that's a sign of <laughs> the corruption, all right? Or, you know, things aren't getting better. I hate to spoil everybody's day, but they're getting worse. You want to be a millionaire? I'll tell you how to be a millionaire. Just put an ad out there, buy this product, and you'll save 10 years off of your life. It doesn't matter even if it's, if it's snake oil. <laughs> okay, uh, you will not be able to fulfill your orders because everybody wants more time. We're corruptible. All right, so he said the dead shall be raised, not corruptible, but incorruptible, and we that are alive, we shall be changed. And then he gives the reason for this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal, where we get the word mortuary, this mortal must put on immortality. Now the time. So when this corruptible shall have put on the incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. You could package that, everybody would buy it. They would. I mean, nobody wants to die. All right. Uh, the sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law, but thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Go back to verse 56. I'm driving down this road, right? And all of a sudden, I don't know what this looks like, but uh, someone told me that, you know, somebody with lights on the top of their car comes after you. I've never experienced that, but, I mean, you know, people yeah. tell me this story. And uh, they, they, and you pull over, right? I mean, I don't know this. It's just what people are telling me. You pull over. They, they pull over behind you. They get out of the car. They come up. And they say, driver's license, registration. I mean, that's what people tell me. And uh, they, and they, and you say, well, what's the problem, officer? And he said, you're speeding. And you say, I was not. And he says, you were too. And you say, I was not. And he said, you want to see the radar? So this is what this verse is. The, the sting of death is sin. I was speaking. The strength of that sin, meaning the proof of it, is the law. That's the radar detector. Someone says, I did not sin. And you bring the law out and you say thou shalt not and they go oh 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 that's that's what it means there when it says that the sting of death is sin the condemnation is that we we did the wrong thing and the proof that we did the wrong thing it's not subject to debate is the law we're all condemned because of the law it's it's the final word you go before the judge and they said, did you do this? Well, I didn't mean that. No, I, I'm not interested in what you mean or what you didn't mean. I'm interested, did you do that? Well, I, I didn't mean to make, make, make any, I didn't mean to hurt anybody. That's not the question. The question is, did you do it or not? That, that's the strength of the law. The law has no feelings. It has no sympathy. It has no mercy. 
it has a oh I understand to it okay it is guilty or not guilty did you do it or did you not and so that's what this is all about in verse 56 the sting of death is sin and the strength of sin is the law then verse 57 but thanks be it to God which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ the way that you can beat the judgment of doing wrong, of which can be proved that you did wrong, the law, is to have faith in Jesus Christ, and he gives you the victory to escape the punishment. Uh, I, sh I probably shouldn't say this online, but uh, years and years and years ago, uh, a uh, person of, of the... Um, 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 of law enforcement, okay, told me after I told him about an experience that someone else had of getting pulled over, he said, you need to get you a sticker. You can get it for five bucks that you support the FOP. <laughs> Stick it on your bumper and you won't get the ticket. And I said, that sounds like the Mafia. <laughs> he said, well, it's spelled differently. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't get it out of principle. I thought, I am not doing that. But he said, yeah, if you have that FOP on the back of your bumper, they'll pull you over, they'll give you a warning, but they won't give you a ticket. And I said, I don't know if I believe that or not. I walked around the back of his car and guess what he had on his bumper? <laughs> uh, I said, okay, well, um, can I drive your car? That's a, that's a so, But anyway, this, the issue is, is about the only way that you can get free from the condemnation that can be proved by the law that you and I have done is to have faith in Jesus Christ. All right? So I give thanks to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brother, be ye steadfast and unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Now, the mystery is that Jesus is coming back, all right, and he is going to change us. Now, who's the us? Go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. And look at verse 2. Paul writes this letter, and he, he identifies who he writes the letter to. Unto the church of God, which is at Corinth, to them that are sanctified, that set apart in Christ Jesus, called to be saints, they're made saints, with all that in every place call upon the name of the Lord, excuse me, of Jesus Christ our Lord, both ours and ours. So these people that he's telling this mystery to are born again believers in Jesus Christ. It's not just a building and it's not just a club because even though he says the church is at Corinth, he identifies who that church is by saying they're sanctified in Jesus Christ. That means set apart. When you and I accept Christ as our personal Savior, all right, he sets us apart from the rest of the world. And he does that with an operation made without hands. He cuts us loose from the body of this flesh. If you remember us talking about that, the illustration I gave is the house has been condemned. We no longer own the mortgage. Jesus paid the mortgage. And he said, you have to stay in there for a little while, but I'm coming back to get you out of that condemned house. And when we accept Christ, our personal Savior, he cuts us loose from the body, the house that we live in. And now we have his spirit and our soul and this condemned house, our body. And that's the reason it has to be changed. You can't rehab condemned you can rehab a poor condition, but you can't rehab condemned. The reason it's condemned is it's unfit for human life. 
And so it has to be changed. And God's going to change that vital body as he refers to it. All right? So as we look at that uh, in the text of which is this mystery of when this is going to happen, when whether dead or alive, our bodies will be changed and will get caught up to be at the Lord. And so we look at that and we often refer to it as as the rapture. You hear God speaking? Yeah. Yeah. Good morning, <laughs> hearing speaker. Amen. As long as it's not with a lot of wind. <laughs> I love hearing I love hearing him speak. All right, so we, we refer to that as the rapture. That's the first stage of a two-part second coming. We see this again in 1 Thessalonians. Turn over to 1 Thessalonians. 1 Thessalonians chapter number 4. And look at verse 13. Paul starts this in verse 13 the same way that I've illustrated before. Why do you tell your kids, don't touch that stove? Because you know they're getting ready to, right? I mean, you would just come up down in the morning after sleeping all night. Your kid walks down. You go, oh, hi, good morning. Don't touch the stove. Because you don't have anything else to say. You say that because you have the inclination that they're going to. And you want to keep them. So he begins with, but I would not have you to be ignorant. So what's he saying? Most people are what on this subject? Ignorant. <laughs> okay, That's not a bad word. We use that uh, sometimes uh, you know, as a bad um, thought or, or you know, like a, a retaliatory comment to someone. Okay, Are you stupid or are you ignorant or something like that? But the word ignorant just means unknown. They don't know. They're, they're ignorant of that. They don't know that. We just made it sound kind of condescending when we use it, but it just means unknown. And so he says, but I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren. So who is he talking to? The lost world? No, who's he talking to? Christians, brethren, right? All right, Christian. I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning the then which you're asleep, that sounds almost like the passage we just read. Would we say, Anne, you were the first one. What does sleep usually mean in the Bible? Death. Death, okay. I would not have you be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that you sorrow not. And that there's a comma after that. Anne, I know you've lost your husband. Other people have lost your mate, Jimmy, and uh, many of you. And so this is, this is not, he's saying, <laughs> I don't want you to sorrow. Period. That's not what he's saying. He said, I don't want you to sorrow. Look at what he says. Even as others which have no hope. All right. So he's saying, it's okay to sorrow. A little bit wrong if you don't. You know, when someone's mate dies and they have a birthday party kind of atmosphere, you're going to wonder, <laughs> uh, well, you know, maybe they didn't have the best relationship or something. Right? But it's okay to sorrow, but don't sorrow as those that have no hope. And then he identifies, verse 14, For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, all right, now what is that phrase to the comma there? All right, if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, what is that in a nutshell? Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Hold your hand there, we're coming back. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And look at verse 1. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the what? The gospel. The gospel. All right. The gospel just means good news or glad tidings. That's all it means. So Paul's saying, I'm, give, I'm going to give you good news here. I'm going to give you the glad tidings. All right? And he said, it's not anybody else's glad tidings. I'm going to give you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also you have received, and wherein you stand, 
And then he comes down in verse 3, and he says, For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received. If you want to know the definition of Paul's gospel, the good news, here it is. How that Christ died for our sins, in a very important phrase, according to the scriptures. All right. And that he was buried... And he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. Those are the tr three aspects of Paul's gospel. Death, burial, and resurrection. When you see that triplet in a passage anywhere in the New Testament, you know by definition that he's talking, even if he doesn't use the word gospel, he's talking about the gospel. Now turn back to 1 Thessalonians. 1 Thessalonians chapter number 4. On what basis can I not sorrow as someone without hope? If I sorrow and I'm hopeless, on what basis would that be? Or on what basis would I not have sorrow without hope? This is what he says. For if we believe that Jesus, here it is, died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with them. All right? So here we have the illustration given to us that Paul is saying, if, if your loved one passes away, you have hope if they have believed the gospel. That's what he's saying. If we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. All right? And then he says, on what basis can you say that? Which is what Paul said. Remember what he said? That Jesus died according to the what? According to the scriptures. And then he was buried and then he rose again the third day according to the what? Scriptures. The scriptures. All right? Look here at verse 15. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord. There it is again. It just keeps coming back to us that the basis of Paul being able to make these statements is what God's word says. That we, and what is it that God's word says? That we which are alive and remain under the coming of the Lord shall not prevent. That's a compound word. We think of prevent like I'm keeping you from doing something. Okay, But it's two words. Pre and event. So when you speak of it in the, the correct English, prevent means you're not going to go before. Pre, not going to go before the event. And so here he says that we which are alive and remain under the coming of the Lord shall not prevent, go before them which are asleep. Someone said to me, well, why is that? I said, they got six foot further to go, <laughs> you know, so they got to get started first, and that, so we're not going to go before them, they're going to rise, and then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up, and that's what he says right here, look at it, for the Lord himself shall descend from heaven, that's the first thing that will happen, with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, oh, look what comes next, there's the trump. So now we know, when we read over there in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, about the trumpet of the Lord, we know that that is the trumpet that God's going to sound right here. All right? So he says, the Lord himself should descend from heaven, that's first, with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God, and then the next thing to happen is the dead in Christ shall rise first, Right? Then the next thing that happens, we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the where? Oh, All right. The same Jesus was taken up from you shall come again in like manner as you see him go up. How do you go up? In Acts chapter 1? In the clouds. Okay. To meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. So the first stage of the second coming is the rapture. And it's at least seven years before Jesus comes back to this earth because there's a seven-year period of tribulation. 
But because there was no date given on when the rapture would happen, I put seven plus years, all right, because we don't know when. He said there's not really an indication in the Bible that when the rapture happens, the tribulation starts. There's no scripture that gives that indication. So we, they're like two different events, and God could make that rapture happen whenever he wanted to. We don't know when it is. But we do know this, that if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so also. So that, that's the only thing that's necessary. It's very interesting that nowhere in the Bible do you ever find any word that suggests that as long as you're a part of that church denomination, or as long as you've been baptized in that water, or as long as you were confirmed at that time, or as long as you were sprinkled at this time, or as long as you lived a really good life and your good works outweigh your bad works, none of that language is ever found anywhere in the Bible. You know what's found in the Bible? If we believe that Jesus died for our sins and rose again, even so them, that, that's the language you find in the Bible. And it's interesting how uh, in the name of Christianity, we have moved so far from the truth that the lie sounds more believable than the truth. Oh, you're one of those people that believe you just accept Jesus and everything's okay? Uh-huh. <laughs> they didn't want me to answer that. They were meaning to humiliate me uh, and embarrass me by that statement. Isn't it interesting? We live in a country where at one time the gospel is what we embraced, and now it is like something foreign almost to us. All right. So here he says, uh, going back to Revelation, I told you, don't be too excited. We're going to get further than two verses today. Uh, verse number seven is the first thing that happens is the clouds. Verse number seven. The second thing is every eye shall see, and there's two parts. One is the, um, we call the rapture, but it's called the gathering in the Bible. The second stage is the return of Christ to this earth at the end of the tribulation. And we don't have enough time to get to that today, so we're going to have to stop there. I do have a couple more jokes if you like those, you know, those jokes. And stuff. <laughs> uh, but we'll pick it up next week on the second stage right here. And when we look at the second stage, and we compare it with what we just read, the first stage, it becomes crystal clear that there are two different events, and they're both spoken of as far as Christ coming back. Now, I'll just say this since we have about 30 seconds. When have you ever heard me say anything, and it only took 30 seconds? But, uh, so when Christ comes the second time, he comes privately, and then he reveals himself publicly, just like the first time. When he first came, shepherds abiding in their field by night, not the whole world, you will find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. There was no room for them in the inn. The world didn't say, oh, he's poor, let's go see him. They didn't know he was here, secretly. All right. And then at 33 years of age, he walks down to the Jordan River where John the Baptist is, and he makes a public declaration of the world. Just like the first coming, it's the second coming. He comes silently, quietly, reveals himself to his own, and then publicly to the whole world. So it's identical. Uh, first coming, second coming, a lot of the issues there are mirrored. This same Jesus, which is taken up from you, so come again in like manner to see him go up. All right? Okay, we'll start. Uh, maybe if I told you what the sermon was today, you'd say, well, let's just keep going. Yeah, I'm not. <laughs> <Okay. laughs> we don't want to go out there anyway. Uh, all right, well, let's close with a word of prayer. Father, thank you so much uh, for your word, opening our eyes to the truth. Bless us, I pray. Again, we pray that you'd be with Phyllis. Know that she'd much rather be sitting right over there in that chair. Bless her, I pray, and bless us as we have this day. And I pray, Father, that the rain and things would not keep a lot of people away. But we have a good group today. We can shout the praises of our great God together. In Jesus' name, amen.
God bless. Have a great day.